Jesus encourages us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. He says, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. This scripture came alive in the life of an evangelist from Bradford, West Yorkshire, England. That man was Smith Wigglesworth. Only believe would be his life's motto. Smith Wigglesworth was born in 1859, the year of the great Ulster Revival in Northern Ireland where 100,000 people come to Christ. I, I always connect that because it was a significant year of revival. Smith Wigglesworth was born into a really poor situation in Bradford. In the early years, his father really struggled and it, it does seem that as a family they were just living below subsistence for most of the time. His grandmother had quite an impact on him and took him to a Methodist church, a Wesleyan Methodist church in Bradford. His grandmother was a firebrand, they called them primitive Methodists. They went back to that early Methodist revival led by John Wesley. They believed in the real fiery Holy Ghost, a real moving of the Holy Ghost in meetings. As a young boy, he sat in those meetings. They used to dance around that, that fire in the middle of the room. They would praise God. You know, he was raised in that environment. He was there and as they danced and his grandmother danced, um, just praising and worshipping God. He looked to the Lamb of God. You see, from the very beginning, that statement, only believe that become his whole life's motto, it was birthed in that room, and a vision that Jesus Christ died for him, and he believed on him. He was born again that night, saved in an old primitive meeting. See where there's life, things do happen. A young life can be transformed. Smith Wiggles, in time, moved from working in the mill. He'd left school very early effectively his education finished, his full-time education finished when he was eight years old. So he actually was operating in a semi-literate state at, at least. He'd become a plumber. At his workplace he worked with an old Plymouth Brethren believer who'd go out in the streets, was a man of the word of God in prayer. And you know, as they worked together and he was teaching young Wigglesworth his trade, you know, he told them about the soon coming of Jesus Christ, that Christ was coming coming soon that he needed to be ready and you know that message he picked it up and it burnt in his life that he must make ready the church for the coming of Jesus again. The family as they sort of improved themselves in, in social statuses seems to have moved across to uh, the Anglican church and when Smith Wigglesworth was 12 years old he was confirmed into the Anglican church and the bishop came down and prayed for him. And in later years, he would say that at that moment, he was filled with the Spirit. That he had an experience of the Spirit then that would be matched by, that would, in a sense, remind him about what happened in Sunderland sort of 40 years later. But when he was 12, that experience of being filled with the Spirit as the bishop laid his hands on him. And in time, uh, working with some of his uh, uh, colleagues, associates in the plumbing trade, he got in touch with the Salvation Army. There in Bradford, his hometown, the Salvation Army come. And this was a whole new realm to him, took him to a whole new phase. When they come, they evangelize with fire and brimstone in the streets. They preached a, a gospel of the blood of redemption that could save men. And you know, he joined himself to them. They, they were evangelists. They were a movement on fire. You know, he would pray through the night with them. They, they would lie on their faces. The power of God would descend and they would go out and evangelize under great persecution. He caught that fire for evangelism, for soul winning. And again, the Salvation Army in that period were, were really quite the charismatics of their age. They were uh, very expressive in their, in their worship, very uh, joyous, very outgoing, exuberant, and very, of course, very mission-minded. And this seems to have suited Smith Wigglesworth to the ground. He moved from Bradford to Liverpool when he was in his early 20s. And whilst he was there, got engaged in working with young people and children, particularly of the, of the poorest of the poor. He laboured there in Liverpool, just labouring with souls, winning hundreds to Christ. But he did have a passion and a burden for souls. He'd speak to people on street corners. He'd go sit by their beds in the hospital. He would tell them of Christ, share the gospel with them. That's where he really dealt with souls, learned how to plead with someone, turn them to Christ. Hands were laid upon him once. He would always break into tears when he testified. But some of those old holy men of God come and laid hands on him and prayed for him ever after that. 
he could stand in a meeting and testify. He would plead with men. He was like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He was a man of real passion, but he still couldn't preach. Still had love for souls, could testify. So that was how God prepared him. When he's 23, he moves back to Bradford. And it's at that time that he meets his wife, Polly, a Salvation Army officer in the local corps. And, and that relationship was going to be the crucial relationship for Smith Wigglesworth for the next period of time. You know, if you were a helper with the Salvation Army, you couldn't have a relationship with an officer, so that caused a problem. But she was a firebrand, she was a soul winner, very able, went off preaching across the country. He couldn't do that, but he could evangelize one to one. He won her heart, asked her to marry him, called her Polly, always called her Polly, and he did marry her. And you know, they settled there in Bradford. Now he started his own plumbing business. He was very good at his job, very successful, very able. But you know, a bad winter came whenever there was lots of burst pipes. He'd become very busy with that business. Little time to read, little time to pray, little time to get alone with God. He was just constant around the clock. The demands of that workplace become greater than the demands to be alone with God. We're told that his heart began to harden really against God. Didn't have time for meetings didn't have time to be with the people of God. And you know, there was a clash between him and his wife, Polly. The colder he got, the brighter she burned. She just began to blaze. She didn't get on his back. She just kept praying, believing God and burnt as a testimony. God melted his heart. He repented, he broke. He asked God to forgive him. And you know, from that day, every work job he was on, he's fixing those pipes. He's witnessing, he's evangelizing, winning men and women to God. Again, working with his hands, but called to win men to Jesus Christ. From early days, Smith Wigglesworth was absolutely convinced that Jesus was still in the healing business. He'd experienced it himself when he was healed of appendicitis. He'd experienced it when he'd been praying for people in local church context. This is long before the Pentecostal message as such had, uh, had, had been, people were aware of. It was just for Smith Wigglesworth almost uh, a logical outflow of the fact that if Jesus has risen from the dead, then he's still doing the same works he was involved with during his days on earth. There was meetings held in Leeds in the north of England, and he went along to those meetings and just simple gatherings of believers, but they were bold in faith. And as he watched, he was astounded that the sick bodies were healed. He watched and beheld, just like what he read of in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the sick being healed. He beheld this, this had a deep impact that would revolutionize his ministry down over the years and would be a significant part of it. And as he was in those meetings, he would get involved. He would go home, he would uh, fill a truck with people of, with sick bodies. He would say, come here concerning a man who heals sick bodies. He'd bring them in there, they'd get healed, saved, changed. So he filled those meetings, he brought lots of people there. He was invited to, to look after this group while the leaders were away, he did it with much fear and trepidation. And of course, he couldn't preach at that stage. He said, well, I'm no preacher. They said, well, just read some of the scripture and, and pray for the sick. Now he's well out of his depths. Do you know into that meeting came real people with real sicknesses. As he looked upon them, that compassion of Jesus Christ rose up in his heart. He went, these people haven't come to be prayed for. They've come to be healed by the master. He made an altar call for the sick and they come out. He went to the first man, which is a Scotsman who was lame. He laid hands on him. That Scotsman got to shouting, got to dancing, totally healed by the power of God. That single miracle revolutionized his ministry. Him and his wife started meetings in Bradford. They not only made a, a stand for holiness, but they made a stand for healing. Christ as a healer still heals the sick today. They start having their own healing meetings in Bradford. They brought many in, many sick bodies uh, would be healed in that small building. You know, it was miraculous what God done there, but God started to prepare him in that small building for a miraculous ministry that would carry him across this world. But it all started with the compassion of Jesus Christ. His heart was moved for the sick and God threw him out onto the, that miraculous ministry because he was faithful to even get sick people to a meeting. He had many experiences with God, with the Holy Ghost, but what he's seen in the book of Acts, he did not have. 
He just longed for more. He wanted a real Pentecostal experience, but he knew that he didn't have that. He knew he had a touch of God in his life. He knew God was using him, but he didn't have that baptism that Peter had, that Paul had, that John had, and he did want it. One of the things that was different, of course, with the Pentecostal movement was that people spoke in tongues. And that was the defining difference between Pentecostalism and the holiness movement, for example. They, they completely agreed on much of everything else, but tongues was the difference. The first person to come to Smith Wigglesworth and tell him about this Pentecostal revival had come to Sunderland was a man who was actually healed through his ministry. When Smith Wigglesworth told friends that he's going to Sunderland to these tongue speakers, well, everybody warned him against it. He said, if I go there and Christ isn't glorified, I won't stay there. So he sat in those meetings. He got to the end of his few days there. Before he left to go home, he went around to AA body and sister body was there. And he started telling her, well, I'm going home now, but I don't have the Holy Ghost. Haven't spoken in tongues, haven't received. And she says, well, come in. Can I lay hands on you and pray for you? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll let anyone pray for me for this baptism. She laid hands on him and then she was called out of the room. And as he sat in that room, the Spirit of God fell on him. He had an open vision of Jesus Christ exalted. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Do you know, he sent a message back to his wife, to Polly, and he said, I've got it. I've got a Pentecostal baptism. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. She didn't like that. Now she's at home, received that message, and she says, I do have the Holy Ghost. He thinks he's got it, I've got it. Well, we'll see when he gets home, says, when he gets home, he can preach. You know, I've watched you, I know you. I know your weakness and your inability. Well, he got up that morning and he began to preach under the power of the Holy Ghost. She moved up and down that pew and she said, this is not my Smith. This is not the Smith I know. What has happened to him? She soon got the baptism as well. You see, when he received the power of the Holy Ghost, his tongue was loosed. From that day, he was able to preach the gospel with power and anointing. Men got saved, bodies got healed. And from that day, there was a shift in a sense in the ministry patterns. It now wasn't Polly who was the full-time minister as it were, but now it was much more uh, a partnership and of course in time it would become the other way where Polly would become supportive of Smith's ministry. Smith Wigglesworth visit to Sunderland when he received the baptism in the Holy Ghost revolutionized ministry. Now think about it, he couldn't stand in a pulpit and preach before. This was the beginning of his preaching ministry, his pulpit ministry. Just straight after this experience, a local factory owner who was a Christian believer heard he'd received the baptism, heard about the Pentecostal revival. He said, you must come to my factory and preach. He went to that factory. The factory owner closed it down. Hundreds of workers, he brought them into those meetings three times a day. Wiggles were stood and preached. There was a revival in that factory. First things that uh, Smith Wigglesworth was involved with after his experience in Sunderland was uh, establishing uh, a church in, in, in Bradford. And um, as with many of the churches at that time, they would do Easter conventions where other ministers would be invited to preach. And that had a, a kind of a dual effect. It meant that uh, there was a, a cross-fertilization of ideas, but it also meant that you were able to hear people that you hadn't heard before, and so invitations would be extended. And it seems to have been through from that period that Smith Wigglesworth was beginning to be invited elsewhere to preach. Now from this time, him and his wife, they traveled out across Britain. They spread the message of Pentecost that they first heard in Sunderland, out into Scotland, out across the north of England, down into the south of England. Him and his wife traveled together for a few short years. 1913, his wife died. When she died, that was a heartbreaking time for him. You know, he wasn't a callous man. It says that he wept. He almost felt like he wanted to die when she died. He was a man of faith, but he was a man of real feelings and thoughts. And you know, just after that, he prayed. He said, oh God, open up a door for me that I'm not, I'm not distracted by that. I want to serve you. And it was just then, 1914, he received the first invitation to go to America. This is just the months, the six months leading into the World War. So he got that invitation the beginning of 1914. 
Smith Wigglesworth was one of the best travelled Pentecostals in that period. He was relentlessly uh, restless going to the States on numerous occasions, to Australia, to New Zealand, to Europe. He was a remarkable maverick. He was, in many senses, a little strange. They would have an illness of cancer in the stomach. He would punch them in the stomach. The no evangelist up to that point ever done that. The American audience looked on as this evangelist punched someone with cancer in the stomach. One incident said a lady slapped him back, was offended with him, said, how dare a preacher punch me in the stomach? But you know, he was angry at that cancer. He could see that the devil was afflicting bodies and he was gonna fight back. That same lady come to the meeting the next evening with tears rolling down her face said, I must testify. She stood up and said, God healed me of my cancer. I, I, I asked forgiveness of the man of God. I hit him. I didn't realize what he was doing. See, there was a bold faith. He assaulted illness. He wasn't playing games. He wasn't hoping. He demanded that those bodies were made well. People would come and stand there, literally with blind eyes. This wasn't behind a curtain. This is in public meetings. And he would say, I know when I lay hands on you, you will see. He would lay hands on them and those blind eyes would open. That happened many times. There was many witnesses that blind eyes were open. Just one incident that I can remember reading from his writings was that there was one child brought without even eye sockets there in the head and, and miraculously God moved and created eyes within it. That's not possible humanly. You know, he would stand there laying hands on them. Legs would be straightened, healed. I believe that Smith Wigglesworth probably affected America in a greater way as far as the Pentecostal revival than any other single man, maybe apart from Seymour at Azusa Street. He was asked to preach at camp meetings all across that nation. And that was the beginning of a very significant influence on the whole church movement there in America. Many were encouraged to step out in faith we start to look at the lives of these early Pentecostals. We easily can fast forward to the glory days. In the case of Smith Wigglesworth, there were many years of being a plumber in Bradford. There were years of working with kids in Liverpool, which nobody would have said was glamorous. There were the years in a mission church in Bradford where life was not always easy and he had other strong characters in his church who in time would ask him to leave. There was the fact that his daughter was profoundly deaf and never healed. The fact that he suffered from kidney stones and would be preaching uh, in acute pain and because of his point of view would not take medicine and so would pass the kidney stones with an absolute agony. All of this is the hinterland of Smith Wigglesworth. There are churches in Australia that were birthed because of his ministry and they're still operating now in Brisbane and in Melbourne. There are churches in New Zealand who would look back to his ministry in the 1920s and 30s as being the key moment where Pentecostalism really took off in their own country. Smith Wigglesworth, as he began to travel out, went to the great nation of Australia. He went there. In those days, they traveled by boat. It was a long journey. Often, he would win men to the Lord. He would preach in those boats. He was a soul winner on that boat. He wasn't just going to hold a campaign. When he got to that continent, he was the main influence, really, in many ways. All the witnesses said to bring the Pentecost revival to Australia. There was a, a great hardness against the message of Pentecost in the evangelical movements of that day, very resistant about it. They heard about these Pentecostals who spoke in tongues and done great miracles. They actually got a dumb man, a deaf and dumb man. And they said, we're gonna have fun here. We know this deaf and dumb man. We've known him for many years. We're gonna send him into that healing line. They thought this was funny. They thought this was a great laugh. We're gonna make a fool of him. Well, they all went into that meeting. And when the altar call was come, they pushed him down there. They're all laughing, nudging each other. They pushed him down into that healing line. Well, do you know that deaf and dumb man was totally healed? The power of God come on him and he was healed. Those young men were dumbfounded and they repented. A revival broke out in that continent. He was asked to come to New Zealand. Moody had been there. 
Uh, R.A. Torrey had been there, held great evangelistic campaigns. But when Smith Wigglesworth went there, it was a greater revival than Moody or Torrey had seen. The souls that got saved, more souls saved. He wasn't just a miracle worker. Souls came in. He worked miracles all right. But there was a supernatural power in those meetings that convinced souls. That's why he won more souls than Moody and Tory as he went out across these continents. And there in New Zealand, it was the greatest revival New Zealand had ever had. These nations, New Zealand and Australia, were deeply impacted. South Africa, other nations were deeply impacted. Nations, not just a town, not even just a city, but nations. And he left the harvest of souls behind him who became the leaders of the future generation. One of the stories about Smith Wigglesworth lives with me is a story that Lester Sumrall talks about himself. Now, Lester Sumrall, he was an American Pentecostal leader, quite a figure in the American post-war scene. Just around the war period, he was in Britain, working in Britain. And he tells a story about how he made his way to Bradford. Um, and Smith Wigglesworth was quite elderly, but Lester Sumrall used to go and visit him regularly. And Smith Wigglesworth would simply each time say, let's read the scriptures together and then let's pray. But the way the story is told is just the idea that here's an old Christian leader who's, who's wanting to introduce a young Christian, who in time will be a leader, but not at that time, but who just wants to disciple someone and does it the best way he knows, which is actually read the scripture and pray. And Lester Summerall talks about how the idea that one day he turned up to his door um, with his bowler hat and his umbrella and a newspaper under his arm. And Smith Wigglesworth took the newspaper from under his arm, threw it in the bush and said, you won't be needing that. And invited him in and starts to train him. Now he does it in his own inimitable style. But those stories are the stories that are the unseen stories. They're not about preaching to thousands. It's about the investment of time in one person. I think one of the lessons you can take from Smith Wigglesworth's life is that God uses eccentric people. Um, that he doesn't use just people who are nicely polished and socially acceptable, but he takes working class people from West Yorkshire with a strong accent that will never leave him um, with methodologies that are very strange um, but he does use them for his glory. I think it's safe to say that he was um, in many ways a man with a single message about the significance and the necessity of having faith in Jesus who would meet you directly and um, make a real difference in your own life now. That, that was his key message wherever he preached. And secondly, his methodology, which was not copied, was not transferred to anybody else. But with that came a colourful nature of the, the Pentecostal evangelist. I think there's more than one lesson that we can learn from Smith Wigglesworth's life. I think everybody would consider the miraculous element, the supernatural element, not just a preaching or a teaching ministry, but a miraculous element element and I think we're all very conscious of that you can't read his life without knowing that but also to learn concerning that bold faith you know there was a real bold faith that overcome opposition the natural thinking of man the unbelief the lies of the devil he, he triumphed over that in a very real way he overcome and as a result of that multitudes of lives nations were affected through his life but you know I'd still go further I don't even believe those are the greatest lessons he was a man of the word of God you don't often hear that he was a man of holiness he wouldn't let newspapers in his door he, he said don't be bringing no, that information from the world in here he was a man who would sit at the table if you spoke about natural things he said I don't want to hear that I want to talk about the Lord so you know he, he was a man he was a holy man he was a separated man he didn't have time for other things these are all things we must learn that he had a miraculous ministry because he was a holy man he was a man of prayer he was an evangelist a soul winner 
And I believe the greatest thing that we can learn from his life is that he was a soul winner. He cared more about the soul of men than he did about the bodies of men. Of course, we know he cared about the bodies of men. He, he had a tremendous heal ministry, but he cared about the soul of man. To heal a body and then still go to hell, it, it was void, it was pointless. But he believed in being a soul winner. He, he witnessed to men in mines under the ground. He witnessed to them on hilltops, in factories, everywhere he went, on board boats and trains. He was a witness, he was an evangelist, he was a man out to take men to heaven. And I personally, I believe that that is the greatest Marcus Smith Wigglesworth's ministry. And I believe the healings, the miracles, the signs, the wonders were just confirmation to the gospel message to bring sinners to Jesus Christ. His ministry was profound on a, a global scale. He was gruff. He was direct. He was in some ways quite uh, straightforward and, and almost simplistic. But the effect of that ministry had an impact much wider than anybody might have guessed in Bradford when he was establishing his own mission hall. And I think it's for those sort of reasons we ought to honour some of Wigglesworth's legacy as, uh, as we look back on, on his life. From